Greetings to my fellow Peace Blunderers and today we're covering game 4 of World Chess Championship 2023 and welcome back into the match thing, welcome back into the match payback time. They said he couldn't do it, they said he broke, he ain't broke, he is coming at you Jan. We now have got a World Championship match on our hands. So the context for this game is that the guys just played out a draw with Nepo playing as white and Dink playing as black ding had a chance to make the position a little bit sharper towards the end but decided to keep it drawish and in the end so it happened it was a draw and now ding as white maybe will try to come back with the vengeance he needs to cut the deficit after all he is one point behind in the match and he is trying to do so with the English, starting with C4. Ding is rolling out his signature weapon, English, well, Dinglish, you may call it. <laughs> I didn't coin that, by the way. I'm not taking any credit. I just stole it. We are now, unlike game one and two, going in a traditional way, because game one and two went in a very crazy way really early on. Now, this game for a while went quite orthodox so knight f6 knight c3 e5 very typical english transposing into the full knights after knight f3 knight c6 now the most popular approach is to be in keto your bishop via g2 bishop g3 sort of applying the pressure on the center from the sides not directly which is a typical english idea ding however went with the second most popular move which is the choir english with e3 bishop before is very very typical the most typical move in that position in fact queen c2 also very nice queen c2 develops the queen and creates an alternative for white because this bishop at most positions wants to capture the knight which does happen and now there are two options either you take with the queen which is the most popular move or you take with a B pawn, which is the second most popular move, which is what happened in the game. Now, why does bishop want to take the knight and why does pawn want to take the bishop? Bishop wants to take the knight because the knight, if it stays on c3, is fighting for some key central squares. You know, the knight on c3 is usually very good for central control. And the dark squared bishop that black has got usually tends to be the bad bishop because black wants to play d6 and lock the pawn structure up and this dark squid bishop is a little bit astray otherwise so why not just get rid of the potentially bad piece for black and of the potentially good piece for white so that's why a bishop takes knight but it has the downside of course of just sacrificing your bishop here but you know on balance it's okay and pawn might want to take the bishop again it doesn't have to it doesn't have to at all in most cases queen takes bishop but ding with pawn takes bishop wants to build a nice little center you see this pawn mass right there it's about to move forward and when d4 happens well the center can become very very powerful if allowed now we see d6 from jan and now e4 remember that in order to push d4 ding doesn't really need the pawn on e3 because he's got the pawn on c3 courtesy of b takes bishop on c3 remember that so like i said the pawn on c3 is going to be very useful for building a center usually we don't want to push e4 before pushing d4 because we need the pawn on e3 to support d4 well we don't need it and what e4 also kind of does is that it prevents all kinds of breaks in the center just renders everything motionless for a while now black castles we've got bishop b2 just a simple developmental move we don't want to put the bishop on d3 to block our own pawn which is going to move very soon and jan now plays knight h5 it seems like a slightly awkward move why would the knight want to go to h5 well the knight <laughs> doesn't want to be in h5 but it's the only way the knight can possibly get to the very tasty f4 square which again was provided by e4 remember that when we play a chess move always or at least almost always there are positives and there are negatives well one negative of a very good e4 is that we concede that f4 square which is about to get exploited so ding gets d4 in like i promised trying to expand the ascent and really take over everything um knight f4 now getting the knight onto a nice square and ding is like yeah 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 
Um, that's fine. I could just take the knight, which he did. Ding took the knight. Of course, pawn takes back. Otherwise, we're losing the piece. And look at this. Ding has now got a very, very, very strong center. Uh, don't get me wrong. This pawn, if protected well enough, can also be very annoying from white's perspective. It is controlling some um, interesting squares in white's territory. However, you've got to hand advantage to white in this position. The center is not to be underestimated. So now the position goes castles, queen f6, just developmental move with the queen and looking over that f4 pawn again, which does need protection. It has a potential downside though of maybe being exposed to some e5 ideas later on down the line, not now. And now we have rook f to e1, a simple developmental move, putting the rook behind the pawn that might get pushed at some point, that's fine. Rook e8 opposing. That rook also fine. And now we get a slight inaccuracy from Ding. It's not anything massive, it's just that it concedes a bit of that advantage. Ding definitely got out of the opening. He played bishop d3. Now, the idea is that we want to maybe at some point get e5 in, punishing that queen on f6. And whilst Jan is dealing with the consequences of e5, take on h7 with check with that battery however there is a downside to bishop g3 first of all it gets instantly punished by bishop g4 which was played it just looks very strong and now the bishop was on e2 protecting the knight it no longer does that on d3 now if the knight gets ever captured the pawn structure on the king side gets slightly ruined which the engine uh nor a human I wouldn't like actually is one of the best moves engine straight out suggests bishop back to e2 defending that knight but Ding is not going to do that of course he committed to bishop c3 bishop p2 seems like a nonsense thing um at the same time Ding doesn't want his pawn structure to get ruined so he retreats with the knight to d2 a square that is arguably less optimal of course on d2 uh, the knight is deeper into white's position and doesn't control as many central squares but it's okay now ding is about to get his advantage back with a confusing knight a5 from jan i'm not sure i understand it maybe i'm not just good enough to understand it the only reason you play knight a5 in my opinion is that you want to push the c pawn perhaps because what future does this knight have from a5 other than going back to um c6 maybe play something like b6 and knight b7 but what does knight do on b7 anyway i don't know so probably wants to push the c pawn to try and challenge and disturb white center well can't really do that if ding now plays c5 and basically prevents Jan from ever playing c5 and now the knight 25 is looking kind of silly probably has to go back to c6 if it wants to do anything in the game and yeah, very good thinking by Ding playing a move which Ian wanted to play. And now we get D takes C and you don't want to take back D toe because if we do, look at this bone structure. Like, what is that? Your center is gone. Your advantage is gone with that as well. No, 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 no. We're not going to take. We, in fact, are planning to push forward with D5, but not before we play E5. E5 has been made possible now that the pawn from d6 is gone and like i said with e5 we're threatening the queen that is arguably slightly misplaced on f6 and we are threatening to take on h7 of course nepo can prevent both these threats with queen h6 a decent move just getting the queen away and defending the h7 pawn which is fine and now we play d5 and we see that this center is getting more and more threatening by the move. Rook d8 opposing both pawns now. Rook on d file, rook on e file, good. And a very logical c4. Supporting the center from the flank, again, only underlining how important that capture at the beginning was. And look at that knight on a5, it's just doing absolutely nothing. Again, I don't understand it. <sighs> Maybe anyone can explain that to me. Now we have b6 supporting that knight a little bit just in case it gets attacked but more importantly I guess opening up the b7 square for the knight because like I said this knight is completely useless has to go somewhere. Can't even go back to c6 now that the pawn is on d5 controlling that square. 
So there you go. H3 now, just a normal looking move, uh, giving <laughs> the king some loot maybe in the end game, but also a very natural move when your opponent's bishop is on g6, asking some questions of that bishop. Bishop just no problem goes to h5, that's fine. They now plays bishop f4, the idea behind it we'll see very soon. Don't forget though that this pawn isn't hanging at all because if rook takes, I don't uh, envy this rook at all. So bishop takes h7 with check and the rook is hanging through discovery attack. So the pawn isn't hanging, it is defended tactically. The idea behind bishop e4 is the following. After rook e7, trying to double up behind that board and actually threaten it, we have queen c3 first. Again, the plan isn't yet complete. And after rook goes to e8, doubling up, we play bishop f3. And now the idea is more or less clear. We want to challenge the bishop. The pawn is back into the defended status. We've got two pieces attacking, two pieces defending. That's fine. And if the bishop ever captures the bishop on f3, our knight can finally safely go to f3, where it was at its best. Bishop, sorry, knight, b7. Finally, this knight is getting some life. And now Ding plays rook e2. The engine doesn't like it too much. It says that whatever advantage Ding had, it's gone now. The position is back down to zeros but ah it's fine it's fine it's not like it's bad or anything the idea is we want to double up behind the e pawn just like jan did because the pawn is defended sufficiently for now but the pawn is defended by the queen and we don't want the queen to stay on c3 and defend the pawn we want it to go around and do some other things so it's better to protect the pawn additionally with the rook so that where the queen can go roam free. Now, Jan plays f6. Never play f6, but on a serious note, this move is actually very good. This move is one of the best ones. It does provoke e6, and e6 was played. Remember that we're not really interested in taking that because uh, we have quite a vulnerable rook then on e2, and there aren't any tricks then with like taking or going forward there aren't any tricks so e6 is more or less forced and now jan is going to argue that after knight d6 this position is just ultras yes the e6 pawn is a very annoying it's a very strong pass pawn supported by another pawn supported by the rock behind and everything but don't forget jan is a pawn up and he is feeling that he can easily defend that. The knight can stay on d6 as long as it wishes. The rooks can stay there, albeit passive. They, they are very solid. And this pawn is defended. This structure is very difficult to break down. And the engine says, eh, maybe white has got a slight advantage, but nothing massive. Now we have rook a to e1, completing that doubling up maneuver. And uh, yeah, this is the point where things started to go wrong for Nepo. You see, Nepo really started playing quickly for seemingly no reason. We all know that he always plays quickly, or at least quicker than most professional players. But maybe he felt too safe in his position. Maybe he thought, okay, so I can basically draw this with my eyes closed because there doesn't seem to be any way forward for white. Which seems a bit counterintuitive considering what he does next maybe he also thought that he's got some winning chances actually here he thought that it's a game for three results and he thought that he may in the end do something with his extra pawn but it resulted in him just not thinking deep enough and straight up blundering <laughs> and it all started with knights to f5 now black actually can suffer from a little bit of pressure after bishop takes h5, queen takes h5, and now that the queen is no longer defending, that pawn on f4, let's pressure it with rook e4. Now, queen can and should go back to h6 defending. It's a little bit passive, and the wound is about to get pressed even harder with queen to f3. Now, we've got two attackers against one defender. And, yeah, what black should play, which not happened in the game, is g5 protecting that pawn twice now with the pawn as well and the position is still better for white 
and it's clearly better for white. It's just that it's not as clear how you're supposed to win. You can play g4, attacking that knight, and taking ampersand isn't really advisable because knight is hanging, right? The knight probably has to go back to d6, and you go back with the rook to e2, and we're more or less back in the same position where black thinks he may have a slight fortress, but black has to make some concessions, or has had to make some concessions, sorry. Had to expose the king side a little bit, and uh, yeah, maybe it's not as easy anymore for black to defend. However, even though this was a little bit eh, for black, what happened in the game was a woof for black, because Nepo, after queen f3, did not defend with g5. He straight out lost the game, the next move with a blunder knight d4 knight d4 uh, maybe on surface level it looks quite nice this is a very good square for the knight it attacks the queen and everything right well first and foremost we may as well just take that extra pawn and you know we'd be quite all right queen takes back we're back even material and this is still strong however this is most likely still a draw because again very hard to push forward. No, no, but that's not what we're going for. We're going for a very good sacrifice, which Ding played almost instantly, I should say. Rook takes on d4. Just rook takes, simple as. When the pawn takes knight b3. <laughs> and the idea is very simple. This knight is about to come alive, and these rooks are just trapped. They're just doing nothing. <laughs> just this alone looks scary and this is only one of the myriads of possibilities now actually i talked about this quite a few times in some of my previous videos where we did some middle game analyses sometimes whenever you are open exchange it may be detrimental to you because you have the wrong piece this position is quite blocked up you see how the center is all blocked and in positions where everything is blocked, in most cases, knight is at least equal to the rook, if not better than the rook. Because what a value does an exchange have for Nepo where your rooks are like these? <laughs> and when Ding's knight is just roaming free, no value at all. And as you can see by the evil bar on your left, white is just now winning. And this is the, where the game was lost, and this is why. The game was lost. Ding is now about to do all the nasty stuff. And yeah, Jan just cannot recover. Now, Jan plays g5. Should have played it, honestly, a couple of moves ago. Not allowing rook takes d4. But what can you do? Too little, too late. Uh, giving a rook a square. Maybe giving the queen some squares. Maybe giving the king a square. And also, supposing our opponent doesn't really matter at this point what Nepo does. It's dead lost. Knight takes pawn on d4. It's about to become a tremendous threat. Queen to g6, at least not allowing the knights to jump into f5. Ding just says, I'm going to take a 5 by 4 <laughs> with g4. What are you going to do about that? Of course, you can take ampersand. Doesn't matter in the end. f takes g, f takes g. I'm about to push the pawn, or I'm about to play. Knight f5 anyway, because the knight on f5 can now be defended just by the queen. The queen has opened up. h5, trying to at least fight for the king side a little bit, to no avail. Knight f5 is jumping in, attacking the rook. We don't want to take that rook, trust me. At least not now. We don't want to take it because we do, and what then? What then? Remember that Nepo is actually up material, and if we just take the rook with the knight, all we do is that we equalize back in material. And the position becomes a fortress again. At the same time, Apple doesn't feel like he wants to risk with his rook. Okay, maybe it doesn't make too much sense to capture it now. But let's just get this rook away with rook to h7. And now queen e4. A very, very, very nice stabilizing move. Just look at this position. Does black have any moves whatsoever? We've got the pawn controlling some massive squares. What is this queen supposed to do? <laughs> Like, honestly, what is this queen supposed to do? It has literally no squares. These are also taken by the knight. This queen can never threaten anything at all. To activate it somehow, you've got to go, like, 
king h8, queen g8, and then queen f8 to maybe go there and attack something. It takes so much time, and Nepo doesn't have that time. The position is completely suffocating for black. That said, Nepo literally kind of has to play king h8 because there may be some discovered attacks looming in the A if king stays on g8. Who knows? And again, this may be some attempt to activate the queen via g8 and f8. Well, not anymore after e7 not anymore just look at this everything completely trapped now queen e7 yes when the pawn moved forward we did concede the f7 square which isn't a big deal after all we just play d6 of course d7 cannot be allowed d7 cannot be allowed because the pawn just supported by another pawn and it promotes so c takes d has to happen knight takes coming with a fork Again, threatening to take some material, attacking the queen. Of course, the queen has to go away. And now, finally, it is a good time to take that rock. And yes, we are in a position now where it's equal material, but there is no way to keep this pawn at bay. Queen e6 now attacking that pawn on f6. Basically, the position is falling apart. King g7 defending for his life. Rook f1 applying even more pressure. Rook h6 defending, and this is the point where Ding says, Okay, since you've committed to that pawn, I'm just gonna create another threat on the other side. Bye bye, see ya, rook d1. Now, this is becoming very, very, very annoying. f5, now an interesting idea to at least stall some of Ding's threats through discovered attack on the queen. It's like, Okay, that's fine. I'm just gonna, you know, get my queen away with check as well. King comes in. Finally, this is what I was talking about. Sometimes these pawns can become weak because usually when the pawns are really far up, your king is just stuck, you know, where it's stuck after castling, whereas the opponent's king can actually be an attacking piece. So the defending side actually, in some positions, has an extra attacker. Thing has to be careful, but it's simple technique. Nothing, nothing fancy. Queen takes f5 with check. King cannot really take here because, hello, rook e1 check is coming, skewing everything in the world. Rook f6 blocking, it's like, oh, fine. Queen h7 check again. King cannot take at all because cannot take the pawn is defended through the skewer. King e6 now, queen g7 now, a very nice move. It's not even about the pawn anymore. The pawn just stays there as a lingering threat, as just a permanent asset. We are attacking the rook. We've just so many other threats. Attacking the rook, threatening if black just ignores it, rook e1 check, and the queen is forced away from the rook so that the rook is hanging. And if we try and defend it again, we just check it again, right? And this time around, rook is attacked twice and the rook is eventually lost. So that's not good. The only way to try and hold on to that rook is rook g6. Of course, the rook is defended, also attacking the queen. The queen just goes to f8. A typical maneuver forcing black to make a decision about that queen, and there is literally nothing that can be done. Queen takes, just takes promotes. Queen literally to any other square. Literally to any other square, I don't know. Queen c6, just promotes. So after Queen f8, Snapper finally resigned, and Dane got his first win at the World Championship. Congratulations! And now we're seeing a very interesting dynamic. The match is back level. We've got two points for each player. And now I've got a rest day as well, which is important, I think, because, well, Nepo is going to be kicking himself for blowing up the lead that he got from game two. And... The emotional swings now are in Ding's favor. He is in the upwards trajectory. He came back, he managed to pull one back, and after a rest day, which probably benefits, I don't know who it benefits more. I guess Nepo would mind a rest day. But then again, when you lose a game, you want to play again and again and again and again, and you can't do that because there is no game tomorrow. It's difficult, it's difficult. There are different angles to it. Anyway, we are up. For some very interesting developments after play resumes and we'll see. So yeah, let me know in the comments below what you made of uh, Nepo's blunder. And if you just so happens to find this video useful, please like and subscribe. Follow me on Twitch. I stream Tuesdays, Thursdays and Sundays. 
find me on chess.com join our discord all that good stuff and i'm going to talk to you very soon my favorite unintentional gambler is love you all see you in the next one